you have to find the education. You can't just sit back and go, well, that dot doesn't connect. The dots always connect. If you watch what these thought leaders are doing from Rich Dad to Grant Cardone, they're raising money by their name, their brand, and they're taking a percentage of the deal. They're not putting any of their own money into it. But the key is, is that you have to know what you're doing. This episode brought to you by Suites at Madison. Meeting in conference rooms for rent by the hour, week, month, or year. Suites at Madison, where business gets done. Check them out at www.downtowntampaoffice.com. Now, on to the show. You are listening to the Invest Florida Real Estate Show, covering topics in lending, buy and sell strategies, property management, hot markets, and tips and tools to guide you along the way on your path to real estate success. You want Florida investment real estate talk? You have come to the right place. And now, our hosts, Eric Odom and Stephen Silverman. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Invest Florida Real Estate Show. This is your co-host, Eric Odom, along with Stephen Silverman, fresh off a trip to Nueva York. Nice and cold, Eric. Nice and cold. New York. I'm uh, glad to be back in sunny Florida. Perfect time of the year for you to be there. So, you know, we, we come back and I, we go to different cities and see different environments. And, you know, investors now have different philosophies. A few years ago, everyone was saying buy. Now the people, some are thinking they should sit on the sidelines and uh, talking to different people, two people, you get three different opinions. Well, I mean, real estate is hyper local and deals are hyper specific. So, just because the real estate market, you might think it's long in the tooth, doesn't mean there aren't opportunities. I think that's what we're going to talk about today, and uh, with our with our with a great guest that we've got coming on. Also, wanted to give a shout out to Jose from Miami, who sends us a quick email, and he says it's time for a Miami episode. Yes, Jose, thanks for sending us the email and reminding us that we have made promises to get down to Miami. It is uh, always a challenge for uh, for us to um, tr- try to get good speakers and, and good uh, guests uh, from outside of the I four corridor, and so. Um, but we are making some inroads there on some potential uh, episodes and guests, and we're hoping that in the next uh, couple months we will actually physically be down in Miami, have a, get a chance to meet with some of our listeners, our loyal listeners in the southern part of the state. Stephen, anything else before? We get rolling. Oh, we always have to remind people, don't we? Yes, please, guys. You know what really helps us get good guests is its reviews. Please go on to Google and onto Facebook, wherever you can, and just, just take two minutes, give us a review. It helps us all get a better education. And, you know, we love doing, we get, when we talk to people, they really like what we do. But when guests are listening and they want to say, do I really want to spend the time to be on the show? Those reviews are helpful. No question about it. I'm not sure our listeners understand that we probably ask about 10 to 15 people to come on the show before we actually get one guest. It's a tremendous amount of work. We don't mind doing that, but you certainly can alleviate some of the issues and that were, and the uh, effort that we have to put forth. If you can give us reviews, there is uh, most guests come on because they want to network with you. They hoping they can find deals. There's some motive that typically they have when they're coming on. And those reviews certainly help provide credibility uh, that there are people listening and that the time is well invested for the guests that come on. So don't want to, Keep beating on that. But if you haven't had the opportunity yet, please go on to iTunes or Google Play Store or Stitcher and give us a quick review. We will give you a shout out. And as always, we appreciate you, the listeners. Stephen, anything else before we get rolling into the show? Let's roll into it. We have with us today, Brian Chavis. Brian is a founder of the Landlord Property Management Academy and creator of the property management designations online. He runs a blog for real estate professionals at landlordacademy.com and is a property management coach for Keller Williams Maps. Brian was named one of the 40 up-and-coming entrepreneurs by the Gulf Coast Business Review. Brian is also an author. I have sitting on the desk in front of me two books. One, The Landlord Entrepreneur, Double Your Profits with Real Estate Property Management, and his new book, Buy It, Rent It, Profit. 
where he explains why rental properties are such a wise investment in today's real estate world, and he outlines the steps and systems you need to implement it. Brian, welcome to the Invest Florida Show. Glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Hey, Brian, really appreciate you investing the time with us today. A successful author, a bestseller, you are still in the streets making it happen, uh, mano a mano. Uh, can you maybe start at the beginning? <laughs> ha, ha, how Genesis. The Genesis. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. And then there was light. <laughs> yes. So how did that happen? How did you uh, – what, what I understand before we sat down, you were Lakeland guy. Correct. Star basketball player. And one day you just popped up and said, I'm going to be a real estate millionaire. Is that how it happened? No, sir. Not at all. <laughs> well, well first was... of all, before he even starts, we have to give congratulations because Brian's sitting here and he came to our podcast to all bright tailed and bushy, bushy tailed and bright eyed. And he's just a new father, three yes, days old. Yes. So baby he Judah. Hasn't, he hasn't yes. had much sleep. So we really not much sleep. So you can ask me anything. I should probably give you a straight answer. <laughs> Now's the time, it. Eric. Now's the time. Now's well, the time. Yeah. And, and the, uh, the thing about Brian is I understand he's no excuses. So in fact, if he doesn't, hasn't had a lot of sleep, that's not an excuse. He's here at the show Correct. in the studio today recording with us. So that's awesome. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. So, so basketball player. Yeah. So basketball was my first passion, of course. Uh, I thought I was going to make my millions playing basketball. Um, You're at Lakeland. Lakeland Senior. Lakeland. Lakeland. Dreadnought. 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 Right. Absolutely. It was a okay. dreadnought. And, uh. What, what year did you graduate? 92. Okay. Graduated in 92. Uh, didn't pass the SAT. So I struggled with the SATs. I was going to go to the, 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 I was going to sign with the University of Georgia. Um, had problems with the SATs, had to go to junior college, then, um, had problems in school, period. Just wasn't for me. So I ended up trying to go and play overseas and did that and came back into the States. Um, and that's when I got introduced to real estate once the basketball was over. Um, in my, my, my mid twenties, uh, I answered I sitting at the house in the backyard. I'll never forget it with one of my friends and, uh, one, someone that we hung out with just was shot and killed, uh, while playing dominoes. Um, and so the next morning, me and my friend, we were there playing dominoes at the time with, with when it all happened. So me and my friend, Dwayne, big shout out to Dwayne White back in Lakeland. Um, you know, we're sitting there in the backyard and, uh, you know, my father had told me, Hey, listen, you know, you're going to have to leave, either get a job or you have to get out of my house. So I'm telling Dwayne, man, you know, let's go up to the corner store. So we, back then, you know, you had the newspaper. So we walked to the corner store, um, when came back to my house and sat in the backyard and I was going through the, the newspaper and c came across leasing. And uh, I was like, this is the job I need. Cause my car wasn't working at the time. I had a Jetta, but it, it, it was broken down. You, it, it ran, but you had to put, jump it. You know, yeah. I don't know if people remember the starter <laughs> jump. So I had to jump it. So I really needed to get a job where I could live and work. And so, um, that's how I kind of got involved with the multifamily industry. It was, it was, you know, for me, I had no resume, really didn't, of course, wasn't a college graduate, barely graduated high school. So I trumped up a resume, put one together. My friend Archer Smith helped me create a resume. We did it at his father's house. Um, so I basically fluffed a resume, lied all the way through it, got a few interviews <laughs> and, uh, and just kind of went from there. And once, I, once I got on scene, and met the manager and they seen, you know, I was charismatic that you know, obviously can sell units or apartments. You know, it was, it was an easy sell. So, so you were leasing. You got into, the got leasing. into leasing. Find it through the job through the newspaper. Find a job through and, the newspaper. Correct. And, and what, in the what kind of neighborhood? What kind of environment? In the beginning, was there was a decent neighborhood. It was Brandon right here. Uh, Providence Park. Oh yeah. 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 Um, I was at Providence Park and, and I forgot the other side. The guy owned it. So I started there, but I didn't work with him very long. He was a private owner, really wasn't all that sharp. And, um, and I think he actually was getting in, in trouble. Um, so I took another job and that's when I really got introduced to real estate and started to learn. I went with, I forgot the company, a, a much larger company that really was big on training and education, but they're also really big on redevelopment. So they would go into some of the, some of the, uh, the, what we call D property asset classes. And, uh, D's not good. D the, means not good. D is D's like a D in school. D is a low income, right? Yeah. D so means low, I dare you to go. Yeah, there. I dare you to come <laughs> after the streetlights come on. So, um, so yeah, we would, they would take D class 
try to move it to a C product and, and, and sell it, you know, value within add, a couple yeah. of years. Value add, yeah. yeah. So, um, but at a very large scale, because when people hear value add, you know, we're thinking about flipping houses and things of that nature. This is institutional grade assets. So you're talking about 400 unit apartment building. So a lot of moving pieces. And so I really cut my teeth there because really no one, they were looking for specific people to take over on the management side and the leasing side. Most of the managers didn't stay long. They would work for maybe six months and then figure out that, you know, dealing it's tough. with the tenants. It is. It's tough. You have tough tenants assets threaten you. Tenant class. You're trying yeah. to evict them. They're going to threaten you. They would come to the office and want to fight. That's how they, I mean, that's how they dealt with things. And so, yeah, you know, that's you're talking, kind of go, go ask him for the rent. No, you go ask You him go ask him for the rent. Exactly. <laughs> you know, and keep in mind back then, the person that was collecting the rent typically in, in their early nineties, there were, uh, it was probably 80, 90% female managers. So, you know, a female manager dealing with a six foot six, 280, you know, aggressive male telling her, no, I'm not going to pay rent and, you know, blase, blase. So it was difficult. And so I moved up the ranks quickly because out of default, I was the only one still there. So, and you're um, living. So yeah, I mean, it, to do the job right, I convinced them, hey, look, I need a free apartment. And I also convinced them to move a few of my friends in from Lakeland. To help me police the situation, and uh, that's kind of how I got my my career started. Oddly enough, wow! So you know, everybody has this point in their career where they take a step that someone else was not willing to take. So your step was essentially, and you didn't, and you're too young really to know any better at that point, right? But you just go go live on site and say I can get control of the situation. I right. need free. So I was rent. just at this time. Yeah. I was keeping in mind. I was just really trying to be close to Ebor City and hang out on Fridays <laughs> and get a paycheck. And hang out on Fridays, have a free place to live. But then, as the years went on, I began to understand how much money these individuals were making. As I was able to look at rent rolls and understand what net operating income was, and understand how all these moving pieces, you know, um, you know, ended up making these individuals that I worked for extremely wealthy. So then I began to become intrigued by real estate. And then, you know, you fast forward many years later, maybe five or six years later, you know, with other projects that I uh, went on to do uh, with a little bit more of a mature head on my shoulders. I began to really look at projects differently and uh, and just really started to soak it up. So I basically never went to school, but that was my college. Multifamily was is where I went to school for five to seven years. So you went to multi multifamily university. You, you didn't read particularly any books or go on no. this whole study, no. which was all done never on the job. It's all hands-on experience. Was, was there somebody? I can tell you the exact day and time when I read my first book. So you know, I wasn't much of a wasn't much of a uh, an arts or an edu- You know, wasn't really big on education. No, but that's you know, important so. because there's so many people who read and read and read, but are afraid to take won't that do first a thing. step. Right, and and that that step stepping out like you did is is a is absolutely. a moment. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, so after you went to that first apart, uh, that second apartment then, uh, or the third apartment, what, wh- how did your thinking evolve? Uh, it, as you, you know, as, as I started to mature as an adult, you know, or, or a young adult, um, it just, you know, and I, I just became intrigued by this multifamily thing. I mean, when you're talking, it just doesn't make sense to see hundreds of thousands of dollars show up on a, on a report and realize that that's actual money. You know, that's, this is actual, you know, it just, you know, it, it just didn't seem real. But as I got a little older, I started to realize, you know, this is real. Somebody is actually putting this in their account, in their bank account. Um, so I wanted to learn more. I wanted to know how they did it. And, uh, so I received as much training as possible. Most of it I, I learned. Was there somebody myself. mentoring you? No, 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 no. This is, I had no mentors. I had. So this my, is just third. Yeah, so that was the whole thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. This is just On this the job. Is what they yeah. call the hustle, the grind. Just, I was well, blessed I, to be I think put what in you this did position. Is you took your, your basketball skills and just did some fancy footwork. And, was it, and, and, <laughs> listen, I mean, everybody who, and you know, there are, there are several, uh, it, very successful investors that we've had on the show. And I think these are always the, uh, the ones that people relate to the most because they came from frequently humble academic backgrounds and there's something that all of a sudden triggered. And, you know, with some folks and it's an, it's a mentor with other folks, it's a thirst in the competition. And I'm kind of curious in reflection, if there has been 
that you would be able to say this was the aha moment that all of a sudden you became energized to huh. and to to learn and and then when you turn that corner were you then more academic like you wanted to read books you wanted to go out what what were the things that sort of happened when all of a sudden the lights were switch went wow on? that's a that's a really really good question i've done tons of interviews and i haven't gotten this this deep um but no to be honest i really wish it was is is i really wish i had something good um to say but i don't because even then I didn't realize what it was I was doing. I was just kind of reading and, 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 and getting an understanding of what I wanted to do. So fast forward to Memorial Boulevard. I was on a project, Arbor Lakes. I think it's still called Arbor Lakes, 356 units. I was at Arbor Lakes. I kind of evolved to really understand that, okay, I want to own rental property, but I thought maybe a duplex or a quad. So the maintenance technician there and I were looking at properties on the weekends. Um, I came across a property off of Howard, old man Freed had it. And it's now some law offices, but it's still there. And I remember going to the building and I remember walking to Mr. Freed and saying, I want to buy this building, this duplex. Me and this maintenance technician, we can turn this thing around and make some money. I know how to do the management side. Mr. Freed said, okay, well, you know, I'm asking a million five. How much do you have? Well, I was, I was short at that time, a million four nine. So, uh, I had to go back to the drawing board and I go, you know, back to my maintenance guy. I'm like, you know, what do we do? And so we was like, well, why don't we just do property management, raise some money and, you know, we'll do management on the side. So we did that for about six months. And then I was like, you know what? We got a full time job. We want to do management for other people. This just is not working. And so I remember one day, I don't know how it, I came across. I think it was a homeless individual I was talking to. Because I'm, you know, that's one of the things I'm not saying it's a hobby of mine that I walk around and talk to homeless individuals, but, you know, I do strike up conversations here and there when I'm from, you know, just hanging out or riding my bike or whatever. If someone's talking, I just remember having a conversation with one particular homeless person and he said something that stuck in my mind. He said, if you, if you want to do something, he said, put it in the book. I don't quite remember how, but he was like, if you really want to expand on your knowledge or you really want to reach hundreds of thousands of people all at once. Put your knowledge in a book, young man. And so I did. I ended up writing this manual. So, hey, whoa, 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 whoa. You can't just jump like that, like some homeless guy, and then you're like a best-selling author. No, well, well, here, no. So, so, so he said, put my knowledge in a book. So he was more sober. I was kind of talking to him about what I do for a living and blah. So we were just talking. He said, what do you do? I said, property management, but I'm going to shut the business down because I'm being spread too many places. I got 300 sure. units that I'm managing Monday through Friday, and I can't do pro people's property on the weekends. It's just not enough. He said, well, take that knowledge of property management and put it in a book. That's what he said. So I did that. I went, put it in this three-ring binder. So you had to crystallize your but thoughts I, and what you No, knew. what this I did what, what, what I did is, is people. there was no thoughts because Picasso said good artists is copy, but great artists is steal. So I, I, didn't, I didn't have to go far to find this book, this knowledge, because I was running these systems every day, running these 300 units. So I just took the systems that I basically was doing Monday through Friday, put it in the book, but put it in my own kind of easy to understand. You know, I took what they gave me and then made it easier to understand and digest for the average individual. And I had this three, by the time I was finished, I had this large three ring binder and I started to sell that out of the trunk of my car to these real estate investment clubs throughout Tampa. So most people that are probably listening to your podcast that are probably from Tampa, they'll go, I remember that kid used to come to the RIA groups and sell his, his little three ring binder. And then he started doing his own workshops out of Kinko in a broom closet. So that's kind of how it started. And then from that, the three ring binder ended up becoming uh, the buy it, rent it, profit book in the series of See, books so that I have. This all seems very logical to you. Chronological, yeah. It's all logical. <laughs> for for me, I'm <laughs> listening to a guy who struggled, told self admittedly struggled with academics, never went to college, wasn't interested in academics, and 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 then at some point, like in his evolution, decides that he's going to be an author, and that's really. Incre that's a, that's incredible, man. Like the, 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 the logic leap from like a guy who doesn't care about books <laughs> to writing books. And it's, it really was the instigation, I guess, of your experiences yeah. that sort of brought you to this point of, I'm, of trying to put it down on paper. Never looked at it that way. I've never quite looked at it like, you know, like today, uh, Joe was asking me, what, what do you do when you wait for your daughter in car, in the car? Because I told him I get to the parking lot an hour early on purpose 
to pick up my daughter from school. Uh, and he's like, well, what do you do? I'm like, well, I take my online courses. And he's like, well, who do you listen to? And I'm like, I listen to these economic, these, these professors from Harvard because you can access their courses through Udemy, sure. which is a, an online platform where you can take ed- online education. You just pay for it. So I can take a Harvard course just like any Harvard grad, except for I'm not paying what they're paying, nor do I have to worry about being accepted to Harvard, but I can take the same course. So I take courses. Um, I just never, I just, that's just, it's like point A, point B. It's, you so, know what so I mean? For, let, I just, I just do it. It never really, I never really sit there and analyze, well, how difficult will this be? What, or how, so, you know. But before you ask a question, because I, I want to go on this train of thought. You at 18 years old had a feeling about. Well, no, not 18. I wish. I graduated at eight, okay. 19. Okay. Well, so. no, 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 wait, wait for a second. You at 18 or 19 years old had a concept of education. And you as a grown man now have probably a different concept of education. Mm-hmm. Could you define and put that in the context of real estate education and like what you thought about it then and how you've evolved to think about it now and what's an efficient way for people to become educated uh, in the field of real estate? How, how, how do you, how would you try to summarize that? Cause I, and I want to tie in wow. that cause I know you've changed. Oh yeah, absolutely. There so, I have. Okay. Yes. So, so talk about that. Uh, so when I developed the Landlord Academy, that's kind of, you know, you're kind of touching on why the Landlord Academy, why did I decide to keep that around and do the consulting and coaching is because there isn't, and there wasn't anyone. This is all this stuff that I've done is, is, is homegrown. Um, now you see people like Grant Cardone and all these people making millions of dollars off the idea and concept. However, you know, when I did this way back then, I mean, this, this wasn't, you know, what year was that? I'm just it was in the early, so it was early 2000s. It was before, like, right at Rich Dad, Poor Dad, where okay. he kind of just kind of yeah, came out, yeah. kind of popped out. But no one was really doing the education and training, nor was I. I mean, I was training. I was benefit- benefiting from being on site, working at the property. Now, you know, because I don't have time to go to Harvard or, you know, I never would probably get accepted. I just, I, I access this knowledge through social media and YouTube. So I find YouTube channels of education just like, the consulting part of my business, it's natural to me to be a consultant, but I had to figure out what a consulting company and a firm did. So I went to McKinsey online, found a McKinsey, which is a large sure, consulting large, firm. Large, the largest consulting firm in the world. Found one of their guys yeah. who teaches classes. And then I went to his class and I learned how to build a consulting company and learned that, you know what? I'm considered an industry expert, but not necessarily a consultant. So I had to learn. I'm the expert. The consultant, what, the, what I learned is that consultants know nothing about the industry that they're consulting. The guy says, Hey, look, I had to understand a cement factory. I've never even seen a cement factory. Didn't even know one existed, but I had to become the industry thought leader on cement factories because that's what we do at McKinsey. So he found industry leaders like myself. I thought because I was a, I knew everything about property management and real estate investing that I could be a great consultant. What I didn't understand that those are two different things to run a consulting business. So my point is that you have to find the education. You can't just sit back and go, well, that doesn't, that dot doesn't connect. The dots always connect. You just have to, especially with, with, with the internet, the way it was now fast forwarding to where we are today. I can access any information. You tell me, Brian, I want you to become an electrician tomorrow. I can access information on how to the basic fundamentals, you know, enough to probably get me shocked to death, but. The basic understanding and fundamentals I can get. So if I want to learn how to evaluate financial or businesses, I'm taking classes on business evaluation that I take at night when the, when the family is asleep during the day, I'm taking some consulting classes. So I know how to build out the consulting part of my firm. Once I figured out, Oh, I'm an industry leader, but I'm not really a consultant. So I need to figure out how to run this consulting firm. Uh, so really the knowledge is out there. You just have to find the individual that you feel relates to you um, as far as a mentor that they can sow seeds into you. And then, you know, and then from there, you just have to be willing to allow those seeds to be sown. I think a lot of people come to the, to the table. I always come to the table. I told him with a whole pound of humility. It's like, I'm never an industry expert. I'm never, I mean, Joe would tell you, I'm probably the most humble individual. I'm always willing to learn because you know, I'm all that empty. You always have to come to the table with an empty cup. So if you can find individuals that can sow seeds into you, that can give you the knowledge, or you're finding a YouTube channel or a podcast like this one where you feel that you can get something from it, 
Um, that's where it starts. That's really where it starts. You know, you know, it's interesting that you say that because that's actually a common theme that you hear from a lot of CEOs. Uh, they were C, a lot of them were C students, <laughs> and they say they, when you ask them how they ended up being successful, they say humility, because I listen to people, mm-hmm. and and I didn't. It's it's not the guy who was top of his class that goes on to Harvard that comes out and knows everything is going to tell everybody how much mm-hmm. knowledge he has. It's the guy that goes, man, I might not see the whole picture here. Let me just sit back and ask a lot of questions and maybe I can see the picture of like getting that knowledge from other people. That's so the key to wisdom is, the, is yeah. asking questions. You know, I have to That's tell you, I loved your, it. your discussion about consultants. It, it reminds me of a story about consultants uh, when one, someone asked, how do you define a consultant? And they said, well, a consultant is somebody who can tell you a hundred different ways to make love to a girl. But he doesn't know any. He goals. never does it, right? <laughs> <laughs> You're right, but that and I, and I didn't know that. I thought they were like me. I thought so, they so, were know it all. So, so let's you know? let's track it back a little. So you wrote this book, and it it received wide acclaim. Mm-hmm. Why is it? What what were people missing? And were there some key points that that? Uh, and let's give a little bit more context too, because at this point, you're 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 consulting, you're writing the book. And you're also starting to invest as well, correct? Correct. So you've got some properties and, 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 uh, and is it, we just get Stephen's questions in a minute, but is it single family duplexes? What no, you- sir. Right to, so the five greenhouses, one red hotel theory. I wanted to jump right to the red hotels because that's what I was skilled. You, my you skills stayed came multifamily. From. You never, Absolutely. you never Absolutely. varied from that. I figured that I would find just like everything else that you guys are kind of pointing out to me. That I'm, you know, I, I I didn't realize that was my mindset. You guys are kind of pointing some things out to me, like, well, well okay, I guess. I just, <laughs> I just said, okay, Red Hotel. How do I get there? How I got there was property management. How I get there today? I'm not using any of my own money. What I do, raise money, and I manage the asset, and I take a percentage of ownership. If you do that and take just, let's just say you take ten percent. If you do that ten times, you have a hundred percent of something without ever putting your money into it. You know, Mark Willis, my partner at in downtown St. Pete. I mean, Mark is God. Like I said, Forbes magazine top CEO. Explain who Mark does, Willis. Who Mark, Mark Willis, Willis is the former CEO of Keller Williams. Right. He's credited with taking credit Keller Williams to becoming one of the the largest real estate company in the world. Um, very successful um, uh, CEO uh, in the in the world in the in the world of real in the world of CEOs in general. But you know, our specific industry, real estate. But, you know, how do you have attract partners like that? You know, these guys are not interested in going there and managing the property day to day. So someone has to manage it. I just kind of figured out a way to say, OK, well, let me take a percentage of ownership, equity ownership versus just pay me to, as a steward, as a property manager. Um, you know, that was something that I wasn't interested in. So I looked to take a percentage of the deal. Can't do that on single family homes because of the economies of scale. I know most readers are going, well, guess what? I got to start at single family homes. I just question whether or not my thing is, do you? I didn't. I mean, I can't, I haven't really sat here and analyzed and said, okay, well, this is what you should do or what you shouldn't do. I just simply said five green houses, one red hotel. If that is the theory, I'm going after the red hotel. I went after the red hotel and I have the red hotel. So I'm so, to, to think that you have to have the single family homes is, uh, is, is really probably, uh, I would have to argue with that. It's probably, it's inaccurate to say that you have to start small. No well, one, who so says that you have to start small? So you're talking about starting. How did you start? Yeah, let's talk about to, your first deal. The first deal I raised money, um, uh, by writing this book and these manuals and selling it, I so, began so to, you started to, uh, to collect database because people were buying. Correct. Okay. Correct. Going to real estate okay. clubs and things. People started coming to me saying, Getting Hey, trust look, in you. Gaining trust as a, I guess now the, the, with YouTube and social media, the term is called, uh, what do they call it? Credibility. It's, uh, no, they, they, well, yeah, credibility, but the credibility is called a, a thought leader. I think right. now. Okay. You're a thought leader. You're a field. thought leader now. So, you know, being a thought leader, it, you know, again, if you watch what these thought leaders are doing from Rich Dad to Grant Cardone, they're raising money by their name, their brand. Sure. And they're taking a percentage of the deal. They're not putting any of their own money into it. But the key is, is that you have to know what you're doing in order to do that. You really, you, you can't attract a Mark Willis to the table and not know what you're doing. You can't attract any, you know, it's not going to work if sure, you don't guy, know what you're doing. Money guy is not stupid. Either. They're not. Yeah. yeah they might be that. some dumb. They're not plum dumb. Yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> so tell us the first deal. What, what, what did you find and, and how did you structure it? Um, first deal lost big. 
2008, um, you know, but I learned oh, a lot wow. from right, it. Right in the... Yeah. Right before 2005 or six, we got it, or six, we got it. Uh, 2008, we lost it. It was my first deal, multifamily. Um, but I learned a lot and I hung in there. We just, the, just the bank that we dealt with really didn't understand, you know, how to, you know, hang in there with me, uh, renew, you know, re, re, reposition the debt. They weren't willing to do that. They were look, looking to go public. Um, you know, I understand, you know, kind of, sort of, you know, their, you know, their, their position on it. But, uh, so my first deal was an apartment complex. Um, then I, of course, went on to have many projects throughout Florida, uh, taking parts and helping the, the management side, taking percentages and of ownership in either the management company or the well, assets. This, this is a key point because a lot of folks never got up off the mat from 2008. Well, so you can't do, I'm not going to let you just skip by that. Well, you're going well, to say, well, okay, you took, yeah. a, you took a lump on your first deal. Took a lump, but that wasn't the major lump. I mean, there's a story here that, that we're, we're going to walk into that's going to be like a, a landmine that's going to blow everybody's mind up. So, that, <laughs> so I'm going to go ahead and walk into it now, just in case we're running out of time. 2008 wasn't the, wasn't the thing that would, that, you know, I kind of factor in. We begin to look at the, um, the headwinds and begin to see certain things happening, um, in the economy. Um, uh, I kind of was bracing myself for, for the 2008, for the big fall, not, the, you know, not it was, for as drastic as it was, I didn't plan for that. I planned for a very short period of time. I didn't plan for that time frame to be as long as it was. I don't think anyone did. However, that wasn't what did me in 2012 was when I financially lost everything. Um, when I was diagnosed with a brain tumor. In 2012, here in, I lived on Davis Island at the time, and that is when probably I had to start from scratch all mm. over again in 2012 because I didn't have any uh, insurance. Oh my gosh! Um, so everything that I had to do, I had to, you know, basically, you know, fund myself, including the surgeries, the chemo, um, you know. And when they did the last surgery in 2014, they removed the tumor from my brain. It was unfortunately located on pr- pretty much centimeters from my motor cortex. So when they removed it, I was paralyzed, lost my speech, my ability to walk and talk. And those are the things that I had to get back. Um, not only that, but also had to try to bounce back financially to where I am today. And which is really, to be honest with you, a very much so still a rebuilding process from where I was um, before I lost pretty much everything. So, I mean, losing, um, losing, uh, that's just something that's in my dictionary. I mean, but I mean. Anybody tells you they hadn't lost, they're, they either not doing anything or they're Oh, lying. yeah, yeah. It's the same thing. It's like, oh, I haven't been sued yet. And they say they're so – you're not successful until you've been sued, yeah. you know. But you're not really successful until you've had those losses. I um, mean, I would never want anyone to lose or have to go through what I went through, you know, with a with a brain tumor because those – the seizures and the, you know, just the chemo. I mean, I mean, a two-year, a year of chemo was uh, – I, mean, I wouldn't want – I wouldn't wish that on my worst enemy, but – to keep moving forward. I mean, at the end of the day that, uh, you know, that's something that, you know, I feel that, um, you know, that transcends any, any, any industry, any and, story and coming mm-hmm. so soon after 2008. I mean, you had the market, which dealt you a bad hand. Mm-hmm. And then when the market started to get back in gear again, and you've got the opportunity to start making it back, but I'm sure right. you had it yet. All of a sudden you got knocked down by the hand of God. Right. Um, how, how did you pick yourself up from that? Obviously, you know, so, 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 uh, and, and that's going to be a bigger challenge than you know, lose a little money in a deal oh, yeah. in 2008. Your viewers should realize one thing right now. If you're going to get involved with real estate, just understand what a loss is. A loss is not your health. A loss is not your family. If you're thinking you're sitting there going, oh man, you know, I just actually unfortunately had someone commit suicide in one of my rental units. Because he lost his job, I just found out. Guys, I mean, killing yourself over losing a job or finances, man. There are other things you can do. Oh man, if I, I mean, if I, if you can just go back and look at some of these YouTube or Facebook videos of what I had to go through with this brain tumor, you'll realize that finances and and, and all that can be you can you can get that back in 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 a, in a matter of so so how you know, did you do that because you're coming from a from a i mean you you weren't in the market you were taken out you'd lost everything how did you position yourself to bounce back 
because you're here today. We're owning property. And you've got and, partners. And, yeah. It's, it's, it, know, somebody, if somebody just turns on the podcast now uh-huh. and realize that it's four years later, you're a successful guy. You've got one of the most successful real estate CEOs in a country on your side. Uh-huh. That happened for a reason. So how, how did that? Occur? That probably happened from a conversation 10 years prior, a decade. So don't ever despise humble beginnings and always remember when you meet individuals, you know, you always want to be on your, on your, on your A game. I met Mark. We had an hour conversation. I went to Keller. Remember, I'm a maps coach. I went to Keller Williams to sell him on a property management training program. It was shut down and turned down, you know, after they took a majority vote, only lost by one vote. Um, thanks, Mary Tennant. Uh, but uh, <laughs> only lost it by one vote. So I remember sitting in his office having a conversation an hour before the taxi, before Uber. A taxi was coming to get me and take me to an airport. We had an hour conversation. We talked about life. We talked about business. And back then he said, I know you're going to be something. I, I, I believe in you. And uh, fast forward 15 years later, you know, he's doing a Facebook um, video saying, hey, I'm looking for investors. I'm looking for projects. Send me deals. And I just reached out to him on message. Hey, Mark, do you remember me? And he, then he fired back. Absolutely. I remember you. And then I just started coaching. He 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 actually got involved with my coaching program. And he was like, well, what do I owe you? I said, you owe me nothing. I'm, you know, iron is sharpening iron here. Um, you know, I'm learning from you. I'm getting to learn from one of the top CEOs. You know, you owe me nothing because he was asking me to help him evaluate a deal. And what do you think about this deal and that deal? Him and another partner. And I was helping them and they were learning and I was learning. But I you're, you're, wouldn't you're, take anything you're, from you're him. You need skill set because you literally like in the streets, like you understand not just the numbers and you can get a Wharton graduate right. numbers. You're the guy who understands. Mark oh, understands man, I can, numbers. I can look right. at this guy and I know from the. Tenants that are in here that wasn't the numbers aren't showing. The so demographics can, right. and psychographics yeah. exactly is what you're yeah. talking about. Anybody can look at the numbers. Hell, sure. those salesmen that sell you the property, no offense to any of my brokers out there, but right. there's a difference between salespeople. Salespeople want to make most want to make money from you. An advisor wants to make money for you, typically. And so, you know, and and again, yes, I don't have the background in the, you know, the 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 fancy fancy degrees in finance. However, you know, I do have street, over 15 street. years of, yeah, actually doing it, the actual experience you know, I of I love it. some of the things that you said only because it, it just goes back to the importance of relationships. Like you really started so writing important. a book because you were, you actually took the time to speak to a homeless person and then you stayed he in contact. He sowed a seed, right. And That's then, how I feel about when I met you, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> stick around. I'll get, I'll, 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 yeah. I'll get you there with you. Get, stick yeah. around. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you never know no, where your so seeds going to come from. I mean, from. so many times right. people just walk past them and and they just treat them like they're a lamppost. Well, you know? you know, I think a lot of it. And I mean, it depends on how you know. I'm I'm a spiritual person. Um, I'm more spiritual after 2012 and what I went through in my walk there. But yeah, absolutely. I mean, at the end of the day, that is you. You just you you know you never know where where God's going to place someone and where you're going to receive that. And I can't tell you how many people are probably listening to this podcast now that have probably didn't pick up a phone, didn't have a conversation with someone or decided to thumb their nose up and are they were too busy or they were going through a stressful day, didn't stop to have a conversation with someone and missed a blessing. And that guy was trying to play relationship. Someone. Yeah, missed a relationship. Well, or they get frustrated because they're, they miss a light, a traffic light, and they're delayed. You never know. There's probably a reason why you're being delayed or you missed that flight. You know, God wanted to put someone in your path. You know, I, w- I had no idea. Mark shot that video. I was like, hey, I'm looking for... In fact, I just so happen to be on Facebook and trolling and doing, you know, look, and I answer it and you just never know. Well, this is the whole thing. Your, your whole story is based on that. And a lot of it has to do, were you a point guard? Yes. Okay. The point guard can always see the lanes opening up. And many people that don't understand basketball, it's, I, you know, for, I talk about energy forces and fields and some people it's, 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 it's some other spiritual, it's their God or whatever, that there are opportunities that are presented to you. But like the point guard that's coming down the court, his head's got to be up looking for the lane to, to put the ball. Uh And, and that's been your whole life. Like your, your whole professional career has been, your head's been up and you're looking for that energy force of 
how to walk through the door and the homeless guy being that, you know, it's a really, it's a, it's a really intriguing a story. And now, you know, your partner was one of the most successful real estate CEOs of all time. So, so we've, I mean, I've found this, some of this philosophy, uh, philosophy, like really interesting and it takes us away from sometimes what we do, but I know you just really did an interesting deal in St. Petersburg. Can, mm-hmm. can we talk about that? And- yeah, that was the deal I did with Mark, um, downtown St. Pete, you know, everyone that wanted to be in, downtown St. Pete, and uh, we found an off-market apartment, multifamily. I was looking for something in in particular, concrete block, garden style. Uh, I was looking for a little more, you know, uh, uh, of, of a critical mass as far as the portfolio. I was looking for something a little larger, maybe 80 units. But again, to be downtown St. Pete, beggars can't be choosers. So uh, we took a 22-unit project, garden style. So I got pretty much everything I wanted Uh Right in the heart of, 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 of downtown St. Pete, uh, Park Plaza Apartments, um, off of Second Street North. Uh, uh really I mean, great. There's project. a renaissance going on there. Oh it's, man, it's, it's just, it's crazy. I, I mean, I've, I've, when we, we paid 2.6 million for it cash and, uh, everyone probably thought I was crazy or oh, he overpaid, but I seen as a, a, another lane example, using your example, I seen a value add play and I think most people were like, hmm, paying 2.6 you're at a four cap or a little less where do you see how do you how is this a value add i mean i i thought i could get nine hundred dollars just understanding the demographic and the psychographics in the area and demographics tells you who your prospect tenant is and psychographics tells you the why and i think most people just look at buildings and assets but i know brick and mortar has never paid me rent people pay me rent so i study the people and the individuals more than i do the brick and mortar um, and I felt that I could get around nine hundred dollars, uh, even with certain headwinds coming. You know, at this time, Trump still hadn't rolled out his tax plan yet, so there was a lot of missing pieces that could cause some headwinds, um, rising interest rates. Even though you know we weren't looking at debt ourselves, however, how are those interest rates going to affect my demographic, my prospect tenant? These are all the things that I'm, you know, that I had to consider and look at. But I think these are a lot of the things that most people don't. They, they, they read a book and they look at it and they talk cap rates and eternal rates of return, but they really don't understand how so, that fits. So what did you do? What concrete steps did you do to reposition the property? The first thing I did was uh, it, there's five phases. There's the acquisition phase, the implementation, stabilization, growth, and then the exit strategy. So where I am right now is the acquisition, which, which was buying it. So we paid cash because I felt it was a deal. 15 days close. And then I repositioned the property to a value add play. But, I, but what I did was focus on curb appeal. So I did some minor curb appeal adjustments to the property uh, from which you can see on a lot of my Facebook videos from, from day one. And then I began to raise rents. I haven't touched the inside of these. I thought they were really, they were well, well, the guy... He did a great job with rehabbing them. So they, they were Ikea, um, kitchens, you know, tile floors. Everything is really was, you know, to me was already rehabbed. So what I've done is just gone in and repositioned and, and began to, uh, bring in a more professional management style, uh, began to really work it and focus on curb appeal. Um, I really think that the tenants were underserved on the management side because management is an experience and people, they pay. That's when we go to Disney, you, you pay for a Disney experience and people pay, you know, big money for that experience. So, and so as you that's what rent, I focused on. And, but you were providing better service. Did you better find, service. did you find that the tenants accepted that? Or? Yes. Yeah. I find that they were coming to me all except for the one that killed himself, oh, lost gosh. his job. God for, you know, rest his soul. But I mean, everybody is just like over the moon. Yeah. And I, you know, at the end of that, I think he was, yeah. he was upset because yeah, he knew that things, I mean, I remember weeks before, you know, this guy was like, man, everybody's coming up to me going, man, this place is, I would never want to leave this place. So, you know, at the end of the day, I think, um, most tenants are like, man, this, this is a paradise because you got to keep in mind, everything is going vertical in downtown St. Pete. Yeah. Everything is brand new. So I'm bringing some, some amenities. We're having breakfast in the garden on, on the weekends. More you know, social. I, That's part I of changed it. the curb appeal in the garden area around for them so they can have a much more social or relaxed atmosphere. So, you know, position it, I've, I believe, the right way, affordable housing. So you've acquired the property, you've made the changes, and you're happy with your investment. Where do you see we are in the market now? You know, it's, it's totally a different point from where we were. Yeah, it's not 2012. <laughs> you know, there's not, there's and, not just 
like, like ripe fruit laying on the ground anymore. And, right. and a lot of people are saying be cautious, and there's also a lot of new construction coming. So, and, and you hear, we hear it all the time. Uh -huh. Oh man, I'm not doing anything until the market corrects. I, I don't know. And I, and, I, and, I, and I keep talking like that. I greatly appreciate it because while you're sitting on the sideline, scared money never made money. So um, while everyone's sitting on the sideline and, and, and thinking about it um, and questioning, you know, we're doing you. I, I feel that, you know, when you look at again and understand the demographics and psychographics and you understand your prospect tenant and who they are, who they are and who they're going to be. You have a better understanding on how to, what type of product to look for and how to prepare yourself for the headwinds to come. Um, but there's always headwinds. There's always challenges. Always something. There's always something, but you can't just keep sitting on the sideline going, Oh, cause I, I had, I can't tell you how many people said or gave me a look. They might not have said it, but they thought, Oh, he overpaid for that product. Well, I either I'm crazy or I'm crazy like a fox. It's still to be determined. I'm not, you know, tooting my own horn, but. You know, look what I'm doing with the rents. I, I'm I'm open to share with anyone who wants to come by. Matter of fact, I film every week training videos on that property. So I will open up my rent roll and I will show you exactly what I'm doing. Um, it's not magic. I'm not going out there with a with a wand. Um, it's just fundamentals. So I I feel like you know where we are in this in 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 this market. I mean, I think we're in a you good know, space. And, and you think there's still more opportunities? Absolutely. Well, there's always opportunity. The psychology of all investors, and you know, from Wall Street, uh, the movie, they talk about it, fear and greed. And, you know, greed is good. But, you know, you have individuals, investors, or that want to be investors, that are always going to find an excuse. And I think really the summary of what you talk about in terms of where we are in the market is there's always a deal. You might have to be more cautious, but don't just shut down because Absolutely. There's, there's always a deal. You have to, you have to, you have to get it probably from the operational level. So where's the scary part for me with these headwinds is the operational level. You have to really have your fundamentals with the management side because when things do tighten up, it's probably going to be, you know, the effects on your prospect tenant. So if you really don't understand or have a great property management company helping you, then yeah, then, you know, some of these, some of these issues you'll probably take uh, on the chin. It could, you know, could, you know, could, could be hurtful, um, you know, could cause some issues. But if you really have your, um, your fundamentals down from the operational side, I really think most of these headwinds are just like any others. They're all manageable. Uh, they're not going to, it's not, we're not going to see anything like we did in the early 2008s. Um, you know, I, I really think, you know, for the most part, this is manageable. And also, you know, another reason why I overpaid 2.6, and I'm using air quotes what, for those who can't see. What's the cap rate you said for? A little, a little under four. Um, is because I'd rather deal with that when I lost everything. It was because I was banking on a, a low income demographic who was affected by such headwinds. But the demographic that I'm dealing with now can sustain. You know, these individuals have great neighborhoods. savings and things like that. Yeah. So yeah, great neighborhoods, you're great neighborhoods, great, yeah. better neighborhoods. But you're going to pay. You're going to have a higher the value, lower the cap rate. You're going to pay, but you can't be scared of, of of lower cap rates when you really feel like there's a there's some value there. So how do investors navigate the waters? Are becoming then there's headwinds. You use the term headwinds. The waters are becoming more treacherous now. And you know you're you're advocating don't go sail to the nearest port and and, uh, and and tie the boat up. You're saying keep sailing. But how, how can investors? What let's say one or two pointers would you say for investors, knowing that we're at market points and you've had some experience now twice of some unfortunate things uh, uh, that have happened to you. What, what wisdom would you uh, give to investors to say this is what you need to do and don't do this and this? as the market becomes into the cycle that we're in right now? Well, I wish I did have like a, um, this is what you do or what you don't do. Unfortunately, I never know. For me, everything has always been on the fly. So I'll say focus on your fundamentals. So when you're, when you're fundamentally sound, no matter what pops up, you don't necessarily have to go to port as you pointed out right away. So where people pull over and they go to port is because they really didn't have the fundamentals down, they, they really, you have to understand your ship you're sailing, number one. So, um, pull that boat over if you really don't have a strong grasp of that ship that you're sailing, or if you don't have a real clear plan on where it is you're going. Um, those are reasons why you probably should pull over and, and get out, uh, you know, why you still can. 
However, if you feel confident and you really understand that ship that you're sailing, um, then you then you move on through the choppy waters and you know how to navigate and you've been through choppy waters through whatever experiences that you may or may not have or team members may have on your team. Um, then you keep moving like I like I do and have always done because I feel that I can, you know, that I, I know my ship very well, um, you know, and I know my compass. Um, and when you know those things, um, and you really understand what your, what your, if retail is your thing, or multifamily is your thing, or single family homes are your thing, if you really know your thing, you know your ship, um, then you sell it. You know, that, that, I mean, I really don't, there's nothing that I can tell someone to do or don't do. You just, you, you have to really, you have to understand what the fundamentals are of your specific, your specific you, you craft. You and your partner, are you buying specifically cash right now? Or are you also using debt? And if you're using debt, what what kind of debt are you using? Scared of debt right now because okay. of my experience um, and also some of the uncertainties. Uh, however, I'm being you know approached by Fannie Mae and, and, and a few others, you know, but I'm I, I'd rather I'd rather cash uh, right Sleep now. At night. Yeah, because yeah, you know, having partners that really don't understand the fundamentals or what I talked about, understand the deal, um, just because they say, "Hey, yeah, we specialize in multifamily." You know, I'm wary of that now. So I really, if we ever really look to do a project and use debt, then you know, I would really have to feel comfortable, and it would have to be a non recourse. And you have to build yourself up. You know, for those who are listening to this podcast, you're just not going to look at someone and say, "Oh, I'm not going to do this deal if it's an you know if 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 it, there's recourse." Uh, to be able to get a non-recourse loan, you, you have to be able to, you have to be a little bit long in the tooth or someone on your team has to be a little long in the tooth as far as the deal, uh, portfolios or having a portfolio or some sort of experience. That's why coaching and consulting is, is really important to find that mentor, um, you know, that I didn't have is because you do need someone that can, you know, that can go after some of these products that are out there. But, um, yeah, for me, if I, I would never say no to anything. But if someone came to me and said, hey, you know, let's look at, you know, some debt financing or bringing it into play some debt, it would have to be something of uh, of a non-recourse where, you know, there's that I'm, because if I'm going to get into bed with these guys um, and they really don't have a strong understanding, you can see that in sports. You see these great athletes going to these different teams and it just doesn't work out because they don't have a strong understanding of the core values of that particular team or what the goals are of that particular team. Sure. And they, you always hear that term. They got to jail. They got to jail. Well, you don't want to jail with your debt guy you know what i mean there is no gel in there they're gonna you know it's foreclosures or, yeah. or bust they're gonna they're gonna look to save themselves so um you know i'm not saying that debt is a bad thing for anyone that's listening it's not um you just have to you know again you it all comes back to fundamentals you really have to be really skillful and know your craft um and, and know your skill set and what you can get yourself involved in or with as far as projects are concerned Let, let's talk a little bit before we let you go about uh the uh buy it rent it Profit Summit. Yes. Something new. Uh, and, uh, my, my man Joe's here. Joe's, Joe's, Joe's like my new manager. So I've, I got Joe's <laughs> going to kill me if I don't mention that at this property, something unique that I didn't have. And there's something that you guys mentioned. What is it? Did I have a mentor? And I said, no, I didn't have a mentor. I didn't have opportunities. I had to make a lot of this stuff up as I went along. If you really want to see this and you're listening to this podcast and you really want to understand, Hey, you know, Come on out to Park Plaza. I'm going to invite you. Our phone number is 800-535-2476. You ever want to show up to Park Plaza Apartments and, and walk and kick the tires and see what it's like to own and operate? Come on out to Park Plaza. Call our number. Schedule. Come on out. We'll, we'll be glad to you know take you on a tour. Um, the Buy It, Rent It, Profit Summit. I'm, I think Joe is going to jump in and, and say something about the summit, but we're going to we're going to be kicking off a uh a buy it, rent it, profit summit. Um, and we're going to be doing this on a, uh, I think a quarterly basis. But Joe, if you, yeah. Joe probably has yeah, more information. Let me information introduce on that. Joe. Joe, the, the manager you just mentioned, the manager, Joe Evans. The manager. He's like a boxer. <laughs> yeah. We talk about his Joe, why did you have a, yeah, let's 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 <laughs> the manager is being very gracious. I just kind of attached myself to his hip and I won't let him let, let me go. Uh, but yeah, we're going to be doing a, a workshop out at, uh, Park Plaza. Uh, we're we're going to have it scheduled. You can look on our social media uh, where you can see the dates that's going to come up where uh, Brian will walk you through the property, uh, kick the tire, so to speak. And uh, he'll go through the whole experience right there on the property for you to give you a real world example of something that's tangible right here in town, what he's doing right now, where you can do that. And then in August, 
uh, we're setting dates now. We're going to do the whole uh, buy it, rent it, profit summit uh, where uh, he will go through exactly that. There'll be it'll be a three day event the buy it, the rent it and the profit. It'll be him and a lot of and other. other you uh, can find that information, the dates that can get on the landlord academy dot com. Uh, absolutely. On yes. the Facebook uh, page, the landlord academy Facebook page. And you guys will be publishing those dates that you're going to be doing those. Uh, absolutely. Awesome. Yeah, right. Okay. okay. Uh, Stephen. Well, guy, it, yeah, I mean, I, that was really a, a wonderful story and uh, we wish you, I'm, I'm keep the vision, the image that comes to me all the time, you talked about ships, but it's the point guard just looking for a hole. Yeah. And, um, and we wish you luck in the, in your next pass. I appreciate it. Thank you guys for having me. This has been a, uh, uh, wonderful experience to be here. Yeah. We, we really appreciate you, uh, taking the time with us, Brian. Absolutely. And that was Brian Chavis, author, investor, property manager. He is, uh, a lot of, Things, Stephen. Uh, it was really, really entertaining uh, interview. Really enjoyed that a lot. What uh, What were your thoughts? You know, Brian is is humble. He's laid back. He doesn't have to impress anybody. But if you listen carefully to what he says, he he what he said is know your market and then be positioned to take an opportunity. I loved his, or actually, it was your analogy, Eric, of of a point guard just looking for an opening in a market. It doesn't really matter at what point of the market you're in. There's always an opening somewhere. There's always. I mean, it doesn't matter what cycle we're in. And I think most of us would acknowledge we're probably late in this cycle, but there's always an opportunity. There's always a play to be made. You just have to be the point guard and have your head up looking for the lane to pass the ball. You know, I, I, I a guy like Brian to, to me, I find to be fascinating. You know, he admitted to us early that as a high school student, he wasn't the greatest at school, didn't care about it much, but it's very clear today the thirst for knowledge that Brian has. He's certainly a very humble person. It, humility, I think, is the is the word that he used, and, and uh, you used it. And it's uh, you certainly can see it that he knows that he can, if he just keeps his head up and is humble about what he knows and doesn't know, that there's always a nugget of information that he can uh, gain to implement into his business and help himself and his family and maybe others around him as well. So, Stephen, great guest, very enjoyable discussion. Other great guests and enjoyable discussions can be found where? www.investfloridashow.com. There's just so many good interviews now and it's a wonderful learning experience. Yeah, and don't forget to listen on your mobile device because when you're in the gym or in the car, it's a great time to listen. Download the app. You can get that on the website, figure out where to do that, and uh, the best way to listen to the show. So, guys, until next time, hasta la vista. You've just listened to the Invest Florida podcast with Eric Odom and Stephen Silverman. Join us every week for actionable real estate investment ideas and, of course, visit our website at www.investfloridashow.com for more shows and tips on how to earn a cash flow in the real estate market in Florida. While hosts and producers of the Invest Florida Show have no reason to doubt the validity of comments of our guests, we do not warranty their accuracy. Please check with your legal, financial, and tax advisors before entering into any investment. Returns will vary from person to person and deal to deal based on unique circumstances. All information expressed in this show is for educational purposes only. Opinions of the guests are not necessarily shared by the hosts and producers of the Invest Florida Show.